you can look at uh, you can look at uh, different. Or I wanted to play a little bit of sound for everybody, and I think I'll plug this in there for that. We'll get there. Um, the exam tomorrow covers everything through last Thursday and like the first few minutes of class on Friday. Uh, when I was uh, before I got to talk about information here, we were still talking about um, about sensory systems um, and the organization of sensory systems and the barn owl studies. Uh, so um, Megan and Amanda and I are all available over email for the next uh, day or so as you're getting ready for the exam. If any last minute questions come up for today, um, we're gonna. Um, probably get through the next three bullet points, um, possibly a little bit into the fourth one here, um, thinking about information and information theory. Um, and so we'll be talking, um, returning to the idea of sensory systems and labeled minds, which we talked about way back in unit one. Um, by the way, in case anybody missed the announcement last class period, the final exam is kind of the only other major exam you have left, and that's open books and open notes. Um, there's two parts to the final, um, an in-class hour and a half part, and a take-home part that you have two hours for. Um, and I'll, we'll have more detail about that coming up. Um, but, uh, so, so, we're bringing this all together, and the final exam being cumulative, um, I certainly hope that, that the Unit 1 stuff you'll have time to review and, um, and be ready to connect it up with what we're talking about now. So we'll be talking about labeled lines and sensory coding, um, and then we'll be talking about the basic idea of what do we mean by encoding and decoding in the first place, um, and then um, coming back to some of the ideas about decoding and encoding, and think about um, uh, these things called, uh, this, uh, this formula called Bayes' uh, theorem, which helps to give us an idea of how we can, uh, of how picking up some new source of information, how if you get some new source of information, that will help you to update uh, how, how likely you think something is. So if something seems 50-50 likely um, beforehand, um, and then you get some new piece of information, how sure can you be afterwards um, about, that, about that something? So that's what we'll be getting into, uh, in, into um, with, with Bayes' theorem. Um, okay, and so just to kind of review, we've got these things called receptive fields, which are not actually physical parts of a neuron, but they're a relationship between the neuron and the outside world for sensory neurons. Um, and, these, and that relationship represents what sorts of things out in the world um, will drive that sensory neuron to fire. Uh, and different, uh, and we talked about this in the context of somatic sensory system, which you can equally, equally well think of it in terms of the visual system as points of light, or the auditory <coughs> system as frequencies, um, and all of these things um, um, represent, again, sort of this relationship between things out in the world and things in your body, um, that, and neurons that, that um, creates um, and, and triggers those neurons to fire action potentials. Your brain knows, because of the idea of these sort of labeled lines, essentially means that your brain already knows um, from early childhood experience and also from sort of the, 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 uh, the way your body is, is automatically wired up uh, genetically, um, that certain things out in the world will get certain inputs to fire action potential, um, and other things out in the world will get other inputs to fire action potentials. Um, and there are also things out in the world that get nothing to fire action potentials. So um, there's plenty of ultraviolet uh, and, and infrared radiation out there. There are magnetic fields out in the world. Um, there are uh, there are high frequency sounds that I, that my ear is insensitive to. And so there's a lot of physical stuff out there that I just don't know about. Um, I can get some equipment that will take that and convert it into a visual display or change the pitches of sounds or whatever so that I can learn about what's out in the world. Um, but, but what I get coming in is not, high, is not sounds that are um, ultra high frequency or, um, or uh, uh, you know, UV or microwave radiation. Um, I'm only aware of some of the things that are out there in the world. And uh, on your skin, there are a variety of different receptors um, that, have, that are sensitive to different types of touch, even in the same area on your skin. And um, we've talked in the first unit about the pachinian corpuscle, which is deep in the skin and sensitive to vibration. Um, if you touch and keep touching, the pachinian corpuscle is, ignores that. Um, something needs to be changing constantly in order for the pachinian corpuscle to respond. Um, and then kind of the opposite of the pachinian corpuscle is the, Mer is the Merkel disc, 
Um, and these are shallow, they're sensitive to light touch, and they do not adapt um, or, or turn off with sustained stimuli, but instead they just, if I touch something, keep touching it. Those receptors will keep firing as long as I'm touching the object, um, and they will, um, and they will uh, respond differently. Uh, and those, sorry, they'll respond continuously. Um, my brain might stop paying attention to them after a period of time because, um, because it doesn't need to know that anymore. Uh, oops. Uh, okay, and so we've got, um, uh, and so if you have a constant stimulus, some receptors are slowly adapting. Um, they respond initially and keep responding the whole time. This is like our Merkel disc, and others are rapidly adapting. They only respond to the change that happens. If the stimulus is constantly changing, vibrating stimulus, then our pachinian corpuscle will rapidly adapt and will jump. Uh, and there are different types of receptors which are outlined in this, um, in, in this figure from the book. Um, I actually prefer to think of them in terms of depth rather than, um, than uh, uh, size of receptor field. Um, but, uh, but again, the ones that you need to know about are the, sort of these two, the Mer Merkel discs and the chain corpuscles. There are, all, there are also shallow, rapidly adapting ones that only respond to changes and deep, um, uh, long, uh, slowly adapting ones that respond to deep pressure and sustained touch, um, but those are, um, but but those are you're not. I'm not going to test you on these, um, especially because Merkel and Meisner get pretty confusing with each other. Um, so so you just need to know those, and then for the final, you should also know about um, about pain. Um, one other thing that I wanted to just mention. Um, is uh, especially with the final exam coming up and bringing together ideas. We talked in the first unit about how um, how pain. There's sort of two types of pain. There's fast pain and slow pain. Um, it's easy to confuse the fact that our uh, Merkel discs are slowly adapting with the slow, not unmyelinated pain fibers. Um, but actually, these and these and all of these are myelinated. Um, meaning they all have, effect. so when those action potentials fire, they take a couple milliseconds to get to your brain instead of a full second. Um, that's in contrast to some pain nerve endings, which can take a full second to get to your brain. Um, and so um, the adaptation and the speed of action potentials going from out in the skin to your brain are two independent things. Um, okay, so that's that's sort of like the quick overview of labeled lines. What questions do people have about that? Yeah. Any residual uncertainty? Last. Okay, and so at the very end of class last time, I, I mentioned. Um, well, actually, I guess we'll, we'll hold off on that for a second, because uh, the, the, the challenge, the, when we get to Bayesian properly, we'll start talking about um, some of the challenges with, with decoding information. Um, but, uh, but for right now, I just kind of want to give, um, to talk about a general schematic for how we um, can think about two different processes that the sensory, that, that the nervous system has to do um, in order to understand what's out there in the world. Um, and we'll add a little bit to this schematic in a couple minutes. But, so the general schematic that we'll be returning to a few times over the course of the next week is um, kind of a relationship, and it's, it's a very high level conceptualization of this relationship between the world out there and our perceptions of it and our ability to figure out what's out there in the world. So sensory systems' uh, job is to figure out what's out there in the world. And, um, and we are, um, the, the, our, the conscious parts of us are a brain trapped inside a skull that doesn't have direct access to anything out there. Right? It can't. It can't make physical contact with anything out there. Um, there's no. There are vibration-sensitive cells in your ears and your skin. 
but there are no vibration sensitive cells in your brain that detect vibrations. Um, most electromagnetic radiation doesn't penetrate your skull anyway, but even if it did, there are no, um, there are no um, cells in your brain that are sensitive to photons of light that do get in. And so in order to know what the heck is out there, um, you need to have sensory systems that take the stuff out there and convert it into action potentials. And so what we've got is this external world. Um, if anyone's taking a philosophy class, you may or may not be debating about whether there is an external world in the philosophy class. We're going to skip that debate. Um, I, I, Thoroughly enjoy those debates at times, but not right now. Um, and so we've got this external world, and in this external world, there are all of these different stimuli. So that stimulus one might be um, some some sound that's in the external world, and stimulus two might be um, maybe it might be a different frequency sound, and stimulus three might be that there's some magnetic field out there. And stimulus four might be um, some yellow photons of light. And on and on and on and on. There's millions upon millions of different things out there in the world that we could potentially be sensitive to. Um, we're not gonna be able to detect all of them, but we will be able to detect some of them. And so this external world gets received by our sensory neurons. Um, some of the sensory neurons are sensitive to some aspects of the external world. Um, others are sensitive to other aspects. And for some things in the external world, like that external magnetic field, we have no sensory neurons that are sensitive. Um, some, some migrating birds do have sensitivity to uh, magnetic fields, but we just don't have any neurons that are receptive to that sort of thing. Um, and so these sensory neurons here do a process called encoding, which is to take stimuli and convert them into action. And then once that process has been completed, we now have in our sensory, uh, in our sensory areas of our brain, we now have no longer stimuli, but we have what we call responses. And these responses might be neuron number one's response might be nothing that's out there in the world that it cares about is there, so it's not firing. Neuron number two, might be sensitive to one of those frequencies of sound, so maybe it's firing. Um, neuron number three might be sensitive to those yellow photons, so maybe it's firing, and on and on and on and on. And we have um, uh, millions of sensory neurons um, that are going to have different responses. And since we know, we have some knowledge about the relationship between this neuron and the stimulus that's likely to make it fire action potentials, in principle, it's possible then to say, okay, there's no, um, there's no purple photons because this neuron's not firing, but there are yellow photons because this one's firing. That sort of thing. Um, and, may, and of course, the sensory neurons are more than just sensitive to photons. They're sensitive to photons in a particular area in the, in, in, uh, in the visual field, um, or to touch not just vibration anywhere, but touch on a particular part of the body. And so between all of these millions of neurons, they've sort of captured all of the things that were sensitive. Um, so, yeah, so, that's, so that is the process of encoding, and the first job of the sensory system is to take stuff out in the world and convert it into some action potentials so that the rest of the brain can have some knowledge about what's out there in the world. Okay, so what questions do people have about that so far? The idea of encoding. Okay. Um, and so these sensory areas then project their axons to other brain areas. Um, and these other brain areas then 
Um, so Um, then these other brain areas will sense and respond to whatever these sensory neurons have been producing. Um, and so, uh, so for example, um, if our sensory neuron, and so, so these other brain areas understand and know the representation and the connection between um, these sensory areas and the external world, and so they begin a process called classifying, um, which is, uh, or decoding, um, which is now they're beginning to sort of um, create a, uh, a relationship or, or, um, or understand a relationship between what's out there in the world and what we're actually seeing or um, coming in from our sensory neurons at this moment in time. Uh, okay, so the rest of the brain is sort of, its job is to classify these sensory, these sensory responses. Um, and then this, then, then in addition to sort of this initial classification, there is some internal processing. And this internal processing um, is going to, um, is, is going to kind of, um, finish the decoding, and we'll add a little bit more about what this internal processing is doing in a little bit, but this internal processing is sort of finishing up the job of decoding, and then, um, and then finally, we have some, uh, what we call a perception, but um, what really amounts to is, um, is a sort of best guess about the external world. Um, and this best guess about the external world is now what we call a list of estimated stimuli. So our, S, our guess of what stimulus one is, our guess, uh, our guess of uh, oops, um, of estimated of stimulus two, um, our guess of the third thing, and so on. And so um, all of the things that our brain thinks are out there um, are our best guesses about what's really out there. Um, if we think something's out there that's not, then we're having a hallucination, which is a normal thing to have in a lot of contexts. Um, uh, we, do it, um, we do it every night when we're unconscious, um, and a lot of times we also, um, during the day, will um, we'll have mild um, sensations that come up where, where you know, um, it feels like, uh, it feel, it, so does anyone ever, uh, who, who carries their phone around in their pocket with them? Does everyone vibrate? So do you ever sometimes like, like touch it and he's like you feel like there's something there so so somehow either a sensory neuron has misfired or a higher brain area has misfired and it's created the, the the estimate that your brain is giving you is that there's is that your phone's vibrating and then you go touch it and you feel it with your hand you get you get more information your hand doesn't feel the vibration and so it's like okay okay never mind that was just a misfire um and so that is so so that's a perception um, it's a hallucination because it's not something that's actually happening out in the world, but it's not abnormal. Um, there are, of course, situations where um, hallucinations are abnormal in some neuropsychiatric disorders, um, but, um, but all of us will have some sorts of sensory hallucinations at some points um, throughout a day, just sort of in a typical day. Um, and so this is the idea, and so the, the whole goal of this is to recreate as closely as possible what's out there in the external world. Yeah. I don't. I guess I don't understand why there's so much estimation involved. Is it because of how many sensory neurons we have, or is it like the speed of this process? It's because it's because your sensory system kind of is not great at what it does, and we'll that's that's we'll get to that in just a second. But um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll kind of take a simple example where that's not an issue, and then move on to a slightly more difficult example where there is an issue. Um, and in the more difficult example, then we'll have to, like, also, that's also going to lead into what we're going to talk about with Bayes' probability. Um, yeah? 
So, uh, but yeah, that's that's a great question, and we'll and we'll get right back to that in, in just a minute. Um, okay. So, um, so yeah, and our, and so, so, so for the first example for this, we'll just um, have we'll, we'll talk about a really simple case um, where there um, we're, we're going to imagine that um, our sensory our sensory system is perfect at its job. And so let's say um, we're playing some game where I've got my I've got I've got my eyes blindfolded. Um, in addition to the you know uh, to, to um, uh, you know playing with visual hallucinations and whatever else you want to do to your neuroscience party, you can play this one. Although it's kind of a silly game, but you know whatever. So um, so we're playing a game with my eyes blindfolded, and the game is that I've got these two fingers sticking up like this, and you are either going to do nothing, touch neither finger. Or you'll touch my middle finger, or you'll touch my pointer finger, or you'll touch both. Um, so, so that means there are four possible things that could happen. Um, uh, nothing, this one, this one, or both of them. So how many bits of uncertainty is that? Two. Two, Two bits, right? Okay. So four possibilities. They're all equally, assume they're all equally likely. Um, if, there, if there's some... Uh, uneven likelihood, then that changes it. But yes, there's four possibilities, so there's two bits of uncertainty. Okay, and so then I'm sitting here on this brain, and I'm blindfolded, so I don't have any light coming in, um, but I have receptive fields, and neurons that have receptive fields in those fingers, and so what happens is the, the neuron that is sensitive to touch on my middle finger starts vibrating, uh, starts firing action potential, sorry. The neuron that's sensitive to touch on my pointer finger doesn't, so... Um, Pointer neuron doing that. Um, middle finger neuron. So what's going on? If you're in this brain. I've got to make a guess about what's out there in the world. What's likely going on out there? Touching touch the middle finger. Right. Great. So and now we have it, 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 we have no uncertainty left. Assuming these are perfect encoders which they're not, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but assuming these are perfect encoders, we are now left with, um, with zero uncertainty um, because we know that you are, um, that um, it's uh, yes, touching the middle, no pointer, um, and that is now the final answer. So we have no more uncertainty about what's left. Um, so that's our, our S residual is zero. Um, because um, uh, all of the probabilities are either one and the log of one is zero, or zero and zero times the log of anything, even zero times the log of zero is zero. Um, and so, uh, and so we're left with. If we add up all the possibilities, we're left with uh, zero, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, negative that is zero. So yeah, so that's where we're left. Um, so, okay, so now our perfect sensory system has solved this problem and we've created an estimate of what's out there that um, unless something went wrong, which we're assuming it didn't, everything is good and we've got a, and we've got a solution. Um, okay, so, got my eraser. All right, so we'll do right, one more example. It's even simpler. Um, so again, uh, fingers, eyes closed. This time you're either going to touch his finger or not. Just my pointer. So you've got two possibilities. Touch or no touch. And, the, and so um, at some moment in time, my pointer finger fires an action potential. Um, and so what's my guess going to be about what's out there? Touch. touch. Yeah. So, so, and so we got, this is one bit, and then we'd be down to zero bits. Okay, so that's if everything's perfect. But our sensory systems are not perfect. Um, and so let's say that instead of um, our pointer finger being completely reliable, and every time we, um, we touch the pointer finger, there's an action potential, and every time you don't touch the pointer finger, there's not, now instead, the pointer finger ha makes mistakes. And so the probability of an action potential on, uh, on this sensory neuron, we'll just call it sensory neuron number one, the probability of an action potential on sensory neuron one 
if, given that you touch, is um, 0 0.9. 90% of the time you touch, get, a, get, a, get an action potential. But 10% of the time that you touch, um, I, you don't get an action potential. And then, um, and so conversely, the probability of no action potential on this sensory neuron number one, if you touch, is just going to be, by definition, 10%. Right, uh, so if you touch, one of those two things is happening, and they have to add up to one in their probabilities. Um, okay, and then, but it also, this sensory neuron is sort of jumpy, and will touch, well, sorry, will fire action potentials when nobody touches it um, some proportion of the time as well. And so the probability, right now, let's just sort of make everything symmetrical. So the probability of an action potential on sensory neuron one if there's no touch, is 10% probability of an action potential on sensory neuron one, given no touch, is 90%. So um, what this means is the thing after the line is uh, is, is the possible event out in, uh, is, the, is the event out in the world, and either it happened or it didn't, and so we sort of as, as, as an omniscient viewer looking at the situation, you would know whether it was touched or not, and so that is stuff that, that externally you have knowledge of, although the, the brain doesn't have certainty about. Um, and then um, the brain does know about the action potential or not. Um, so what the brain is getting is that, and the event that happened in the world that either led to it or didn't is that. Um, okay, and so now, we still have two possibilities. Still have one bit of uncertainty to start with. Either you're touching my finger or you're not. But now I get an action potential. So, what would be my best guess about what's out in the world? A touch. Yeah, best guess is a touch. Am I completely certain of it? No, not completely certain of it. Um, and, uh, and I think in this situation, because I kept everything symmetrical, it works out that um, the probability of a touch, so me, as a, so me as a brain, I'm trying to figure out what the probability of a touch is. What I know is that there's an action potential on sensory neuron number one, and in this situation, that sort of intuitively, the intuition is probably that that's correct, that that's a 90% chance because this neuron is 90% reliable, um, and in fact that would be, that would be correct, that the probability of a touch if the, if the brain find here's an action potential, it'd be 90% of this, 90% chance of that. And then you could also, so then you could also calculate um, the, um, the, the residual uncertainty. Um, and actually, rather than me do that, um, let's take like three minutes in a group to calculate the residual uncertainty here. So our S prior is one bit, and then the question is what's our residual uncertainty and then also the information gained. So let's take a couple minutes, try and work that out in the group, and then we'll come back together, just kind of review from last time. Oh, and while you're doing that, also get out your homeworks, and, and we'll come around and collect those. So I think most groups are pretty close. Um, you can keep your papers and kind of keep looking at it as we go. Um, so I just wrote up for, for uh, in general, our entropy is negative sum across all of the different um, individual instances or individual cases of the probability of each case times the law of base two of the probability of that case, and then you just do it for all of them. So here we have two possible situations, either either my finger is being touched or it's not. Um, in the forehand, there's a 50% chance of uh, being touched, a 50% chance of not. And so um, this works out log base 2 of uh, 0.05 is, is negative, uh, negative 1. Half of negative 1 plus half of negative 1 gives us negative 1. And then take the negative off and we end up with 1 bit. 
Um, so over here, then we're going to have negative 0 0.9 times log 2 of 0 0.9 plus 0 0.1 times log 2 of 0 0.1. Um, and so uh, what, what is that for guys? I didn't actually calculate it before class. Uh, 0 0.489. 0 0.489. Or uh, uh, and then um, and then switch it around. So we gain half a bit of information. Um, so uh, even though we're now ninety percent sure, um, we're still there's still a fair amount of uncertainty left about this because our, our this one sensory neuron is reasonably reliable but not great. Um, but but you know uh, yeah okay so anyway that's that's um, that's that and then our information gain is going to be just um, prior minus residual. Um, which is going to be 0 0.5. So that's how much we gain. We're left with some uncertainty, whatever we don't, we're not left with is what we gain. Um, and so back over here, the perception, the estimated stimulus that we have is going to be, um, we're going to, the brain will choose whatever it concludes is the most likely things out there in the world. Um, So the most likely thing that is out there that caused that pattern of action potentials that the brain gets coming in is what it will deduce is what's really out there. Any questions about that idea? So that's the idea of encoding and decoding. It's coming up with a guess of what's out there in the world. Um, so Colleen, does that kind of help answer your question from before? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, the, so, so because our sensory systems are okay, but not great at their jobs, um, then, uh, then, they, and then they make these mistakes. Um, and, so, and, so we, and so the best we can do is sort of a good guess. Let's see if I can get this thing to there. <clears throat> Okay. So, um, and so with that example that we just did, we were just talking about um, a pretty um, narrow case with one um, particular sensory neuron, and that particular sensory neuron um, has some sort of relationship with what's out there in the world, um, and so that is, um, and so and so it's going to have, uh, it's going it's going to give us some information. Um, it doesn't fully answer our question though, because like all sensory neurons, that one is unreliable. And we talked a little bit in the language unit, and we'll um, listen to an example in just a minute about that. Um, but because our sensory systems are unreliable, we need to get all of the possible clues we can. And so we don't just rely on our sensory systems, uh, what, 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 our, what one sensory system is saying, but we combine the information from one sensory system with many others to get, um, to get a full picture. Um, that's in a sense what you're doing if your phone vibrates, if you feel like your phone's vibrating in your pocket and you reach your hand to it, is you're not sure if that's, um, if that's a real vib vibration or if some, one of your sensory neurons is firing inappropriately. Um, and so you reach over with your hand to get another sensor over on that phone and see if that other sensor agrees with what's going on. And if it does, then you have a really high likelihood that, that your phone is actually vibrating and you don't have two sensors hallucinating at you at the same time. Um, in addition to that, we talked about like in language, and we'll have another example of language in just a minute, but the McGurk effect, where if you see somebody saying da, but they're actually the sound that they're making is ba, then with your eyes closed, you just hear the ba, and you're pretty good at that, but with your eyes open, you perceive it as either da or the intermediate ga, um, because, um, because your brain is collecting the visual information and using that um, to make sense of what's going on out there. Um, and in addition to that, the other thing that we, uh, that we collect or that we are aware of is um, what we call prior knowledge. So you come into class, you expect that I'm going to be talking about information theory today or at least something related to neuroscience, um, and so you have some prior expectation of what you're likely to be hearing about in here. Um, you have a pretty strong expectation that I'm likely to be speaking to you in English, uh, and, um, and so with all of that prior knowledge, 
you will then um, have a better chance of making sense of what I'm saying if, uh, if you sort of bring that with you and, um, and already have some thoughts about what's going on. Um, you may need to update your, your guesses if I tell you something that's surprising to you, but having some prior knowledge will help you to make sense of most of the stuff that I'm saying. Yeah, sure. So where is this information kept? Is it in the hippocampus? Uh, it's, it's really hard to say. I think it's pretty widely distributed throughout the cortex where that sort of prior knowledge is. Um, I mean, some of it's in the hippocampus for sure, um, but there's a lot of it that's elsewhere. And I mean, you also have prior knowledge just about what English is like and the sort of cadence that you expect in an English speaker's voice in general, um, and also the types of phonemes that they'll use and where word breaks occur, which is actually returning to in just a second with that. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, so that's um, uh, so that's yeah. It's, it's 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 sort of in this internal processing. And actually, I'll go ahead and write it up here, but we'll we'll say a little bit more about it. Um, but all of our sort of prior knowledge, um, and in this case, prior knowledge includes things you already knew plus um, information that might be coming in from other senses that might be relevant. So the combination of visual and auditory sensations coming together. So all of that is sort of um, additional information sources that, you, that can help you to figure out the sounds of the words coming out of my mouth, or if you have your eyes open while somebody's playing the touch game, um, and you don't see anything touch your, touch your pointer finger, but there's an action potential there. Now, it's much more likely that, you're, that that neuron just misfired. And, um, and we'll actually deal with an example of that in just a minute. Um, but that's sort, of, that's sort of with your eyes open and that extra source of information, you have a much better guess about what's out there. Um, and we can actually formally, mathematically describe this, ex this better guess situation using um, something called Bayes' theorem, um, which is a way to mathematically take into account what we already know, our prior knowledge, along with what new information we're getting in from our sensory system right now. Um, and, so, and so in general, not, not, this, is not, this question here is not specific to Bayes' probability. This question, this question is the general question that your brain has to answer. What's out there? What's in the world? What, um, what, what, are, what should I be perceiving? Um, and that's actually, um, because your sensory system is, is so noisy, that's actually kind of a, 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 a badly formed question. Um, a much better question is to say, what's my best guess? What, what, um, I, I can't know for certain what's out there because my sensory neurons might be misfiring at me. Um, but I can, taking into account everything I already know, plus all of the stuff coming in from my sensory neurons, I can um, come up with a best guess. And so that is going to be what I said here. The most likely stimulus is what our, is what our goal is. We want to figure out what's the, what's the most likely thing that's out there. Um, and so in answering this question, um, we want to take into account, first of all, what are the likely things that might be out there? Um, so uh, if I say a sentence that's phonemically ambiguous somehow, um, and it could, like, like when, like when the, um, the Google Translator thought that EP was speaking in Spanish for a minute. Um, it was, he wasn't speaking in Spanish, he was speaking in English. And you, as, as, as a human being looking at that with the sort of proper prior knowledge that he is almost certainly going to be speaking in English, were able to perceive what he actually was saying. But Google had, um, had, didn't have the prior certainty or as much prior certainty that he was speaking in English. And so it came up with its best guess about the phonemes that were coming out of his mouth, which was some, some Spanish sentence. Um, and so by having that prior knowledge, you were actually able to correctly classify and correctly perceive what he was saying um, by knowing that it's most likely that the, the words coming out of his mouth are going to be in English. Um, and then we also need to know this sort of relationship between what's out there and these neural fire responses. So, um, so which neurons fire to a f sound versus a v sound, um, or an a versus an e, or whatever. Um, and so by understanding these sorts of relationships, like the one I just covered up here, um, where, um, where our um, probability of an action potential on sensory neuron, if we're not touched, is this, and the probability of, oops, no action potential 
there's no touch, is that, um, by knowing those relationships, that's going to be critical for us to make a guess about what's out there. Um, and then in addition to that, we need to, um, all of our probabilities need to add up to one, and so we need to sort of relate this to the overall chance of seeing some response. Um, and so, uh, and so we'll get an equation for that in a second, but this is a comic that I think illustrates a lot of the key points about this. So um, on the left side here, imagining, this is from a, a, a webcomic called The Oatmeal, um, hearing a noise in the house, some thump sound. Um, if, you're, um, uh, if, if you're not home alone, sitting there on the couch watching TV, um, then it might be somebody else in the house, it might be the cat, it might be um, the roommate, it might be some wind, and so you're like, whatever, whatever that now is, eh, who cares. Um, and, and, and so your, your, your guess about what's out there is something innocuous is out there. Um, if you're hearing in the, ha the same noise in the house when you're home alone, um, then you start to freak out and, um, and maybe somebody's coming to murder you, um, maybe there's some you know, crazy monster coming to attack you, and then you get all scared and freaked out about that. And so that is because in these two situations, the same stimulus coming in has Different, you have different prior guesses about what's likely to cause that, and those different prior guesses give you um, a, different get, a, get a different final conclusion about what's likely to be running around in your house right now. Um, and so the actual relationship for Bayes' theorem is that the probability, so again, what we're trying to figure out is the probability of a stimulus out there. And actually, I'll come over and write it on the board in a second. But the probability of a stimulus, given some set of responses in our sensory neuron, is equal to the probability of that stimulus before we knew what our sensors were doing, times that relationship between the probability of the response and the probability of the stimulus, divided by the probability of our neurons firing at, um, at a particular moment in time. So let me come over here and write that out a little bit more, and then we'll talk about what it all means. So the probability of stimulus number one, whatever stimulus number one is, given response, let's call it response A in our sensory system, is equal to Whatever the probability of stimulus number one was before we heard about our, our nervous system. So if stimulus one was likely, then we are going to get a high number here, and it's going to remain likely. It might change its probability a little bit, but if it started out to be something that was really likely, then it's going to keep being pretty likely. Times the probability of the response in our sensory system given that stimulus out there. So um, if, uh, if our sensor is really reliable at reporting that stimulus, then we're going to give a lot, then, then we're going to say, if, if our sensor is really reliable at reporting the stimulus, then we're going to say there's a good chance that the stimulus is out there once our sensor went off. Um, and then divided by the, oh, sir, the overall prior probability of the response. Um, and this is a term that really exists so that all of the probabilities add up to one. It's a way to re sort of renormalize everything so that all the probabilities add up to one again. Okay, so um, one of the classic examples um, of Bayes' theorem in action is. Um, is uh, from, from medicine, sort of uh, ideas of particular medical tests. Um, so imagine, that instead of trying to figure out whether we have some stimulus out there and given some set of responses, we're trying to figure out if we have a particular disease given some, um, given some uh, new test result that we've got. And so, in order to figure this out, we need to know some things. So, for example, so here, here now our question is instead the probability that we are sick given a positive test result. Um, and so, maybe our test has a 90% accuracy. 
So the probability of getting a positive result if you're sick might be 0.9, So uh, 90% of people who get this test, who get this pop, 90% of the people who are sick. So if you have 100 sick people, you give them all the tests, 90 of those 100 people will come back with a positive result. So that's actually kind of cruddy for a test, but you know it sounds it sounds like a test. Um, and so uh, and so that's sort of our 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 our, um, our test that we're going on. And so you go to the doctor. You just heard about this awful disease. You go to the doctor and you insist, I need to be tested for this disease. And so the doctor maybe resists at first, but finally gives you the test, because maybe you don't have any of the other symptoms, but he gives you the test and it comes back positive. So then you start to freak out, oh my god, there's 90% 90, there's 90 chance that I've got this, this disease, 90% chance that I'm sick. Um, but the other thing that you need to take into account is the probability that you were sick before the test result. So this is not given any new information. This is after our new information. This is before our new information. And so maybe only 1% of the population has this disease. Um, okay, so, um, so that's sort of our setup here. And then the question is, okay, so how, are you sick, really? And so to answer this, we want to say, okay, now we've got the test results. <laughs> um, so the probability of being sick, given the positive test result, is this. And so in order to do that, we need to say, okay, well, this is before you had a 1% chance of being sick. Now you've got a positive test result, which is the scary thing, and that increases your probability by that. And then um, the probability of a positive test result, um, it ends up being a little hard to work out. Um, it takes an extra couple steps. In the, in the exam question, I'm always going to give you the denominator for any, any question that you have to deal with with base theorem. But in this case, it works out to be somewhere around um, the probability of a positive test result it ends up being somewhere around 10%. Uh, <coughs> Um, okay, uh, and so this is this is our situation, and so then the question is, well, are you sick? And so we multiply and divide all these things together, and so we get um, 0 0.09 divided by 0 0.01 um, equals uh, 0 0.9. Um, oops, did I do that? 0 0.00. Yeah, 0.09. Divided by 0.1. Yeah, so 0 0.009. Okay. Is that right? No, that can't. No, no, no. no. The, the numerator the is 0 0.009. Oh, right, 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 right. There we go. That's where it is. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. So so um so so you know before before you got that test, you had a one percent chance of being sick. After you got that test, your chance is up to nine percent. But there's still a ninety-one percent chance uh, that you're healthy. Um, and so you're freaking out about this disease um, because you've got this positive test result. But still, really, you're probably just fine. Um, and, so, and so that's why, this, so this is sort of why it's, it's important to, to take into account these, these prior probabilities. And there's a video that I have where it actually walks through a couple examples of this with real data from breast cancer patients and real examples where um, a patient might have a high prior probability and get a negative result. And then a different patient has a low prior probability and get a positive result on a mammogram. And the woman with the positive result with the low prior probability actually has less of a chance of having cancer than the woman that had a high prior probability with the negative result. And they actually do this with like real um, examples in, in one of those videos um, in real data. Um, but so this is this is sort of the, the situation here. And if you um, if you think about it. Um, it kind of makes sense because let's say a hundred patients just like you walked into the doctor's office and they all demand the test. One of those hundred patients has the disease. And so the doctor runs this test and, um, and what comes back is 10 false positives ten, uh, plus one true positive. So 11 people get a positive result. 
And so if you're one of those 11 people, only one of you is sick. And the chances that you are the one that's sick is now higher than it was before that positive result, but is still pretty low. Um, and so it's still a little under 10% chance that you have that disease. I rounded a couple numbers in here for simplicity, but that's sort of the key idea. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Okay. So, um, so let's go back and do, actually, I'll leave, I'll leave this up a bit. We'll come back over here to do um, uh, a nervous system. <clears throat> so we're going to come back to our question before. Um, is my finger being touched or not? Um, and so the, the, um, we're going to do a slightly different sensory neuron. We're still, if my finger is being touched, if my finger is being touched, the probability of an action potential coming in is 90%. If my finger is being touched, there is a 10% chance that the neuron misses it. Then um, we have our probability of an action potential on sensory neuron number one given no touch. And this sensory neuron um, is kind of a jumpy neuron. It's sort of a little overexcitable. And so even when you're not being touched, it's still 50% of the time fires action potentials. It's just kind of going a lot. It's kind of firing a lot of action potentials. Um, it's sort of, it's, it, 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 it's overly excitable. And that's, um, as we'll see, going to lead to some problems for us. Um, and then the probability of, in, of no action potential on sensory neuron number one, if there's no touch, um, is um, probability of no action potential on sensory neuron number one is that. So when it's not being touched, half the time it fires and half the time it doesn't just on its own. Um, and then when it is touched, it, it's more likely to fire, but sometimes it even misses the touches. Okay, um, and so, uh, and so, in order to calculate this out, um, the probability of so what we want to know is the probability that something touched me, given that we just got an action potential coming out on the sensor there. Um, and so. Our prior probability, so that's going to be, what's our prior probability of being touched? Times um, the probability of an action potential if you did get touched on the sensory neuron, divided by, um, the, divided by uh, our prior probability of getting an action potential. Um, and this prior probability Again, this is something that I normally will give you on an exam, but just for this problem, I'm going to tell you how to calculate it. Um, so our prior probability is equal to the two different cases. So the probability of an action potential um, if, we are, uh, if we are touched um, plus the probability of an action potential um, if there's no touch. Um, and then um, all of that gets multiplied. Uh, no, actually, yeah, that's it. So, so just the two, we just add up the probability of an action potential in those two cases. Um, OK, so, uh, so with that, um, the question, there's sort of, uh, the, the, the question is, we got an action potential. What is the chance here? And there's actually two parts. So in, question, in part number one, our probability of being touched is 50%. So maybe you got touched, maybe you didn't. And then in part number two, 
you're pretty sure you get t you, somebody touched you before before um, you even see this. So maybe you saw something come close to your finger, and you think it touched, but you couldn't see clearly enough to see for sure if it touched. You see them come close, and it looks like it touched. So here, you're not sure your eyes are closed. Here, you peeked, and you're pretty sure you saw them touch. Um, and so the question is, in these two cases, the question is, what is the probability that you really were touched, given um, that you got this action potential on the sensory neural network for both of those two cases. So take a minute to try and work that out, and, um, and Megan and I will be around to help with that as you go. It's, 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 it's not about one probability, it's like that one probability changes more. No, 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 I get it. I literally just picked the last number. Yes. Um, okay, so it sounds like people are getting close to finishing up here. Uh, so, um, in our first case, where the prior probability of being touched uh, is 50%, um, what is um, now? Uh, what's now after we get these action potentials coming in? What's the chance that we got the, that touch? What? Oh. 0.643. Yeah, the, I think that's what everybody got. 0 0.643. Uh, I think that's that's what everybody got for that, um, and that seems that seems right. So, um, our, our and, and, and the and so for this, since there's only two possibilities, then um, the other possibility makes up the, the rest of the chance, and so it's um, um, so it's uh, uh, point uh, so, so it's, it's um, whatever 46 percent. 45% Actually, actually, yeah, so, so let's, actually one more problem to, to go and work out just for the last couple of minutes because I ended up choosing the wrong thing. So now, um, let's say, your pro your, let's say one last, one last question to work out where your probability of getting touched instead of 90% chance, you, you peaked and you're pretty sure you didn't see them touch your finger. Um, so if you peeked and you're pretty sure you didn't see them touch your finger, then that's the probability of being touched. So try and work that one out too really quickly. It should be pretty... It also might change because of the Especially because the arts are pretty stiff and the arts at the same time are like a lot of that. Um, okay, so, so let's come back together as a group. You can finish up as we talk. But um, So the first, the first, there's sort of three different points that I wanted to make about this. Um, the first point is illustrated by this here, um, which is if you compare this question to the, the first one I gave you, where we had, um, in the first one, it was um, the probability of no action potential with no touch was 0.9, the probability of an action potential with the touch was 0.1. There, our sensory neurons pretty good. And what was the answer for that? It ended up being like 80 something percent. So, um, so when, when our sensory neuron is pretty good, then we have a pretty good final certainty about, um, about whether we were touched or not. And then all I changed between the question you did earlier and the one you just did for part one was I just made the sensory neuron more jumpy so that it fires action potentials when nothing's going on. Uh, and by changing that property of the sensory neuron, even though it's still responding 90% of the time to touches, it becomes much less useful as, a, um, as an indicator of whether or not you've been touched because it's firing action potentials all the damn time. Um, and so this sensory neuron is all of a sudden now much less useful to you. Instead of being close to 90% certain that, you, that you're being touched, now you're barely over 50% certain. So that's sort of the first one. Um, the second one here, so with this, it worked out to be what was the probability um, in this case? That was 0.94. Yeah, something like that, 0.994. So after feeling, the after feeling the action potential come into our brain, we're a little bit more sure than we were, but we were already pretty darn sure that we got touched. Um, and, so, um, and so this is um, something else that we think about in information theory, which is um, redundancy. So this new, this new um, fact that this sensory neuron is firing an action potential is pretty much redundant for us. We already knew that was going to happen. It doesn't give us any new information. And so if you want new information, you need something that is 
different from expectations, and that's part of the reason why the brain tunes out the fact that your socks are on your feet, even though there are Merkel receptors on your feet that are constantly firing all day telling you, hey, socks here, hey, there are socks here, hey, there are socks here. That's not new information, so you just ignore it. It's kind of like if you're playing 20 questions, and your first question is, um, it, is, it, is it living? And the person says, no. And then you say, is it not living? And the person says, yes. It's like, well, that was a waste of a question. You already knew that bit of information. Um, okay, and then so down in this last case, what does it work out to be? 0 0.018. Yeah, something like that, 0 0.18. Um, and so here, our sensory neuron, in part because it's kind of crappy, but actually in large part because we're already pretty darn sure that we're not, that, that, that we're not being touched, um, that sensory neuron isn't going to give us that much. Our prior probability dominates this. Um, and um, and we already were really sure that we're being touched. And so, and so the, or are you really sure we're not being touched? We, we saw nothing hit there. Um, and so if, if you, it, it's, it's sort of like, you know, if, if, if you feel, if anyone ever feel like there's a bug on your hand or something, if you go look, sometimes it was reflexively hit. But if you look and you don't see the bug there, then you're not going to, the, the perception goes away because you get that, because you have that extra information. Um, Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Okay, so there's one more quick demo that I want to do. Um, so hopefully the sound will work for this. Um, I'm going to play a word that I said in class recently, um, and hopefully you'll... Correct. So that was, that was my best attempt to isolate that word out of a thing. So I'll play it once more. Correct. So... What, any guesses about what word I'd said there? Any sound, any phonemes you could make? Eh, or, or, eh maybe an eh, maybe a rat, re, re, yeah. Re, re, um, rest, yeah. Re. Wrist? Rest. 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 Yeah, that's a good guess. Um, so the, the sentence that surrounded that was, um, uh, was something about, uh, was like, that's not the, Assignment for now. Right. 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 Yeah. Oh, so no yeah. And so I'll play the whole clip like in a second here. Years. Um, I the part of the problem yeah, that I have is actually clipping the sound out. So here it's coming up in a couple seconds. Assignment for right now is cheap. The assignment for right. So the part of the problem is the right. The t in the right actually ran into the n, so it was like snap. And it was really, it was, they were almost run together phonemically, and it was really hard to isolate the T. But in the context of either the sentence or in the context of the class, you know what's coming and you have some prior knowledge, and that allows you to perceive it. And you don't realize that your brain is taking into account prior knowledge. But in fact, your brain really is taking into account this prior knowledge um, in order to build the perception, and that's integral to making perceptions. Um, and like I said before in the language unit, there literally is not enough information in the vibrations coming out, even if your ears are perfect sensors, which are not, but even if they were, there's not enough information in the sounds coming out of my mouth to make sense of what I'm saying. And that's not a me problem, well, it could be partial, but it's not totally a me problem. It's a problem of physics, and it's a problem of speech, and it's a problem of how, talk, how fast people talk. Um, and so you need this prior knowledge, and your brain and your brain unconsciously uses it before you even have a perception of what's going on. And so that's kind of the core point of that. Okay. So what last questions do people have about any of that? Okay. So on your way out, be sure to turn in the assignment, and um, the exam is tomorrow. Let me know if you have questions about that. Uh, again, just goes through Friday, the first part of the exam.